So should we start? Okay, sir, you may start. Now okay. I request to Professor Venkatesh Singh uh, to welcome our esteemed speaker and uh, request him to present his talk, Professor Venkatesh Singh. Okay. Thank you, Vijay Rajji. So this is Venkatesh of Central University of South Bihar, Gaya. Namaste and very good morning. Today I welcome all of you on behalf of Department of Physics and the organizing team of this virtual science lecture series, which is organized by the Department of Physics, School of Physical and Chemical Sciences, Central University of South Bihar, Gaya. I would like to thank all the online participants for showing their interest and taking part in the ninth lecture of this series. Today, we have the pleasure of having none other than a very young and dynamic scientist, high energy physics expert, my good friend, Dr. Raghunath Sahuji from Indian Institute of Technology Indore with us. Let us first welcome him from bottom of my heart. Dr. Raghunath will speak on collider experiments and social benefits. This lecture would be beautiful blend of experimental physics and its application. And as I believe should attract huge attention from the knowledge loving physics students and young faculties of our country and maybe reply of many people who always question such experiment. I welcome Dr. Raghunath Sahuji to this science lecture series. Dr. Sahu is physicist and current associate professor in IIT Indore. He is very at active member of CMS, which is at Large Hadron Collider, Geneva, Switzerland, and a star at Rick Relativistic Heavy Ion Collider at Brookhaven National Laboratory, New York, USA, as a collaborator. Dr. Sahu is elected fellow of Institute of Physics, UK, a prestigious science academy. He earned his doctorate degree from Institute of Physics, Goneshwar, in year 2007. Dr. Raghunath Ji is well-traveled and well-known figure of his area of research. Again, I welcome you, Dr. Raghunath Sahuji, and we are really grateful to you for accepting our request of delivering today's lecture, sharing time with us for your busy schedule. As I have always mentioned before each lecture that our speakers are internationally renowned and real gems of their area. Therefore, they do not need detailed introduction. However, for curious participants, we have already uploaded his very short CV on the Science Lecture Series website and Facebook. With these few words, I would like to request Dr. Raghunath Ji to please deliver his talk on Collider Experiment on Social Benefits. Dr. Raghunath Sahuji, please. Yeah, so good morning to all of you. I guess you can hear me well. Yes, uh, Professor yes, Singh, can you, can you hear yes, me? Perfectly, yeah. Yes, perfectly, yes. Okay, perfect. Yes. So, namaskar to all of you. And uh, it is a tough corona time all over the world. And always I have seen the positive side of the uh, game. So if you look at uh, the advantage uh, is today we are sitting at different corners of India and the world listening to each each other cannot have happened in a real time. Real time means if you go back to another uh, six months, uh, January, February, so this was not expected. But the negative side is the physical touch. Physical touch means the personal interaction level is uh, decreasing. So anyway, but we have to live with this. And I am uh, highly thankful to Professor Singh, uh, Venkata Singh, for uh, giving me this opportunity. Essentially. Assigning me, this, assigning me this job of uh, a social responsibility. You know, we are high energy physicists. We more often deal with basic science. But uh, it is a social responsibility to talk to the public what is collider experiment and the social benefits. And uh, this uh, topic is chosen by Professor Venkatesh Singh. And since uh, he happens to be my senior, 
I thought, you know, I should take it like, you know, a responsibility and try my best to deliver it. And uh, the positive side of uh, Dr. Singh, I have seen, is always dynamic. And uh, 15 years back, when we both met in uh, Cavendish house in Burkhaman Rastal Laboratory, since then we are good friends and we always exchange smiles. So smile is a positive aspect of life and let's exchange uh, smiles. Okay, so let's distribute the positive energy. So thank you for organizing this and let me now go to the topic. Uh, so I need a laser pointer, my daughter taught me, let me go to laser pointer, great, yeah. So let's start with fundamental science and technology. So slowly I plan to go to collider physics, then the related uh, technological aspects, technological spin-offs we'll discuss. And I will uh, brief you about future technologies or future colliders coming up uh, worldwide. So accumulation of new fundamental knowledge and development of scientists and engineers which is human resources development aspects. So this is actually the basic mandates of most of the research laboratories on basic science. Development of new applications is not a formal mandate. So anybody working on social, uh, uh, basic science must be aware that immediate application is not our mandate. To teach the next, next generation to develop basic science theories and to small experiments is our immediate mandate. And results of basic science do not lead to immediate applications. Today's basic science is tomorrow's technology. I remind you, 19th century development of modern physics, the way it happened from 1897 with Rutherford's, uh, with uh, J.J. Thomson's discovery of uh, first uh, elementary particle electron Till, you know, uh, till we went up to electroweak unification in the 70s or so, glass of salam, we wine work. So up to that time, you might have seen it was a revolution in basic science. And the repercussions or immediate spin-offs in social science, we are witnessing that. And I'm sure next generation will enjoy the development of basic science, which has happened so far. However, explorations in the new domains of basic science require new instruments and hence new technologies. So I will discuss in details about this. Let me take a couple of examples of basic science and their applications. Theory of electricity has given us electric light. So this is a trivial daily affairs to everyone. We are not surprised to know what is the theory behind electricity, but we are always tempted to use the light, fan, all home appliances without trying to understand how electromagnetic theory works. So this has become the, you know, the earlier theory of electricity has become a daily life uh, application for us. If you talk about unification of electricity and magnetism, started with Maxwell. So we know the electric motor generators, which has contributed to electrotechnical economy. Atomic model, theory of nucleus, these have given to X-rays. We know X-ray applications, nuclear energy, fusion, fission, and uh, fusion reactors are also coming up in France. India is a collaborator. You talk about Newtonian dynamics, you know, we, are, so we study in the basic plus two level, intermediate level. Space science, so this has led to space applications like satellite, weather forecast, telecommunication. We talk about general theory of relativity and special theory of relativity. This has helped in an immense way, giving the precision global positioning system. If we do a physics calculation, we'll realize if we do not take into account the contribution of special and general theory of relativity, our error per day in the GPS system will be 10 kilometers. And we know with what precision with GPS system our flight, our aircraft lands. So the error is 15 meters if we talk about taking care of a special theory of relativity and general theory of relativity. So this is a matter of great details, technical uh, technicalities. I urge the younger generation to work it out, taking these aspects 
how gps works then we talk about nuclear magnetic resonance which helps in mri imaging and um, we know these are couple of examples and the ease of living is associated with technology technology is a by product of basic science applications that is the reason we cannot ignore basic science if you look at the growth of applications with fundamental science abstract fundamental knowledge becomes familiar as i told you electricity and electric lights or fans abstract fundamental knowledge becomes very familiar while switching on the light or tv people have the impression that they are familiar with the electromagnetic phenomena and we know while evaluating students even if it is uh, age old you know people have to understand the basic or intrinsic uh, aspects of uh, electromagnetic theory so i take this picture from uh, the famous book by a former uh, son director general i will suffer the lord of collider rings at shan so this talks about a pyramidal growth of technology the base of which is basic science we cannot ignore basic science if we have to make a progress on technology so you can see all the developments have happened when we started to understand past classical mechanics so that has given to thermodynamics and mechanics and slowly we have moved to steam or turbine engines uh, so it, you know this is a growth with time and similarly you can take our understanding of atoms nuclei particles and we are in the domain of quarks now so each and every basic science development has led to technological evolutions to give another example if you look at the famous scientist theoretician of cern john well so he gave the idea of entangled quantum states and he proved that einstein was wrong because einstein and what's telling that uh, he doesn't believe quantum mechanics he says god does not play dice the basis of new technology of transmitting secure coded messages is actually based on the theory of entangled quantum states as a application of which in 2007 the public vote in geneva happened so now you see a basic pure basic quantum mechanics pure end of the uh, top of the envelope of calculation has led to quantum information and uh, essential elements of quantum computers and people working in high energy theory or high energy experiment must be knowing the greatest achievement of the modern physics is unification of weak and electromagnetic forces which is called electroweak unification part of the standard model for which people got nobel prize like glass was salam and weinberg and this may one day find unexpected applications so who knows because if you look at electricity and magnetism to start with these two are different aspects and maxwell started uniting okay in a similar fashion we have already united weak and electromagnetic forces and theoretical investigations are going on to unite all the forces and our gravitational wave discovery is a way forward in that direction and we'll find one day that this unification of forces may lead to technological applications which our next generation may witness so if we talk about technological spin offs and the entanglement of science and technology research is often limited by what is technically available to make progress fundamental science need new instruments new technologies depend on fundamental research and fundamental research also depends on technologies for example after the discovery of microscope we started looking into the composition of blood and related developments so you look at the development happened in biology and medicine because of the discovery of the invention of microscope galileo's telescope revolutionized the view of the universe this started the era of observational physics earlier to that during newton's era or so everything was actually of course in the falling of apple was uh, observational physics but the real observational physics the credit goes to galileo's telescope so the lesson here is a symbiotic approach of science and technology 
is necessary. Forefront symbiotic is a biological word, so interdependency. Okay, so interdependency interdependency is actually the basic thing. You know, uh, in a progressive approach in the development of science and technology. So forefront scientific research to be coupled with technological innovations. So that is the way to move forward now. So I remind you something regarding growth of technology. If you see the left hand side, I saw the world before transistors. So I guess, you know, in my childhood and, you know, people of my age, they might have seen if they have opened the radios of that time, which was a big box or TV set. So we used to find many uh, tr transistors like this, which are vacuum tubes. In fact, I was playing, you know, dismantling these things. I was playing with this kind of transistors in my childhood days, in my high school days, without understanding anything. So slowly, when we started to, you know, come to our master's days or so, we started learning about transistors. Now you can see it is a way forward if you look at uh, transistors to a typical transistor like this, from vacuum tubes to transistors. And the Intel co-founder, Gordon Moore, predicted in 1965 before our birth, you can see that each year, so the, you know, how many number of transistors we can accumulate in a chip, integrated chip will double. So that was actually the prediction of Gordon Moore. So that is actually a graph showing technological development with time. So if you can see it from 1970 to here, 2018, so now we have gone up to, you know, uh, uh, 3, 9, 10. Of, so of course, 10 to the power 10 order of magnitude, putting number of transistors in the IC circuit. And for example, this has actually helped us keeping the whole world in terms of a phone in our pocket. So this is the technological advancement of uh, last uh, century or, you know, uh, 30, 40 years. So the best example is if you take Apple's iPhone 6 or 6 Plus with new A8 chip, it has 2 billion transistors, 20 nanometer dimension. You think about the technological development. The next generation or the present generation like my daughter, they may not feel what, you know, what progress we have achieved in science and technology. But I can feel immediately when I look back to my memory lane when I was looking into vacuum tubes, dismantling a radio, now you see an iPhone on my table or in my pocket giving all information about the world. And it has 2 billion transistors. This cannot be realized unless you have a hands-on experience of seeing the old stuff. So this is the technological development we have made. And you cannot ignore the basic principles or basic science application in this kind of technological growth. So now let me slowly migrate to high energy physics. So basic science is a human curiosity. It is driven simply by how and why of things. Necessity is the mother of invention. Technology gets birth out of basic science and as applications. And scientific curiosity has driven us to understand what are the fundamental constituents of matter. If you look at this uh, picture, this is, you know, the matter which we can see visually. Started, we slowly started looking into the atomic level. Then we started knowing, uh, uh, you know, the atomic structure that, that is a nucleus. Nucleus has proton and neutron as constituents. Electrons are moving around, revolving around. And further down the line, with technological advancements, of course, we could see that that is something called quark structure of nucleons. The protons and neutrons are having quark structures. This could happen with the fundamental principle of optics. If I want to see an object, object dimension is D, the probe lamb uh, wavelength lambda should be less than or equal to D. So if you observe here, so slowly the lambda is going on decreasing. Once I want to see the quarks, my lambda is much less. In fact, it should be in the penetrating level. And when lambda is less, this de Broglie's famous equation will tell me less lambda means a high momentum and high momentum is essentially high energy in relativistic physics. Okay. So we need high and high energy to 
probe the macro, the classical world to subatomic universe. So subatomic universe probing needs high and high energy. So from this slide, I would like to convince what is the necessity of going to high energy accelerators or the high energy probes. So now in a similar line, basic science endeavor to understand the fundamental structure of matter. The same things I showed the matter, atom, electron, proton, and quarks to probe. So we wanted higher and higher energies. And you know the way our vision works. This I can see in my naked eyes, and slowly to go to atom and electron and higher. Possible to see the DNA structure through this microscope, tabletop microscope, which we see in our botany lab, in our geology lab. So we started seeing. Uh, developing electron microscope. I'll talk about this. And once we started seeing lower in dimension, lower and lower in dimension, going to 10 to the power minus 18 meter, so we wanted an accelerator like a Large Hadron Collider. And you can convince yourself these accelerators at nuclear level we have in Calcutta, VCC, TIFR, Bombay, Institute of Physics, Bhubaneswar, Bhava Atomic Research Center in Bombay. So these kind of, and also in IUSC, Delhi, in several places we have uh, this uh, level of accelerator uh, doing nuclear physics. But if you want to go to particle physics, quark level, so you need bigger accelerators like Large Hadron Collider or the Relativistic Heavy Ion Collider at Brookhaven National Laboratory. So I think at the end of the talk, I will convince you why it is not possible to have this big scale laboratories in India. So how much high is the high energy? So this, this is a fun, more fundamental questions to my knowledge because anybody says high energy, but without understanding, at least the, the beginners, the students, experts are experts always. So what is the high energy means? What is the scale of highness? So before this, let me remind you that since we are looking into the deeper into nature and E goes like one of our size, the previous expression, I the Gurgle's famous equation. So this look, looks like a powerful microscope. This is the fundamental principle behind a powerful microscope. I need high energy probe to look into low in dimension. Okay. So my energy has to be high. Energy high means let's go to Einstein's famous uh, equation of E is equal to mc square. But E is very high. Now I do not need to convince you. On the right hand side, I will have multitude of particles, high energy, more number of particles, more massive particles. So that is convincing. In fact, the right expression will be, I should put a sum here, sum over of mi, means many different kinds of particles in a nature's way will be produced and many exotica also, high mass particles, if sufficient energy is available. So this is guided by famous Einstein's equation. Now I have taken high energy. I have discussed about multitude of particles. Now let me see if Boltzmann's fundamental equation, these are small equations, and in my knowledge and understanding, these are beautiful equations. So E is equal to KT is also telling me by high energy, I am also going to very high temperature. So if you recall, very high temperature takes me to early universe scenario. So doing this experiment, what I am doing is to probe the subatomic universe, we need high energies as a probe. And this produces many particles in the final state. I can apply statistical mechanics. I can apply thermodynamics. I can do many physics. It opens up a new branches of development in basic science. And in the final state, we have a high temperature. And this takes me to early universe. So how do we do that? So now let me take you to the journey of electrons to quarks. So if you look here in 1897, the discovery of the first fundamental particle, which stays elementary till now. So that was done by JJ Thompson, who got Nobel Prize. And his son is also a Nobel Prize. It's very interesting. And he discovered it as a particle. 
his son discovered it as a poem so you see the son and father uh, uh, duo giving <laughs> or getting two nobel prizes okay so i'm not going to that so here you can see the important aspect is the carriers of negative electricity or cathode rays are the constituents of normal matter that is the contribution of jj thompson many people try to understand this cathode rays but he was the first person to identify that these are the part of the normal or the constituents of matter and this happened in a tabletop experiment okay so cathode rays coming and we know we can accelerate in electric field and we can deflect in the magnetic field and if i have a fluorescent screen a zinc sulfide kind of porous fluorescent screen so then any spot coming here would tell me that okay so i have seen a particle then further characterization is a different story so the lesson here is we can see the electrons in our naked eyes and the energy requirement is very small just to give you a number i remind you that ionization energy of hydrogen atom is 13.6 electron volt so we are in the electron volt domain for example you can see it is something like 13 to 13 to 14 1.5 batteries okay so this much you know now in the battery language i'll take it to large hadron collider that is why i'm saying this energy requirement and the energy requirement to probe the quark we are def different and again since it is interesting to know the structure of atom also if you recall it is what is the geniusness lies in these people why they got nobel prize why others are attempting could not get nobel prize so to encourage the next generation let me point out that aspect also in fact geeker and marsden so they actually did the experiment who are actually the student and postdoc of uh, rutherford so they looked into this alpha particle scattering large angle scattering so they started interpreting from the prevailing uh, structure that you know uh, this uh, large angle scattering is because of the multiple scattering of the constituents but it was rutherford who showed from the calculation and also interpreted that small angle scattering cannot lead to large angle scattering for example it is like a random walk problem it's a drunkard's random walk problem so you cannot cover a large distance if you are drunk so you go to and fro so this cannot give a large angle scattering so that must be a, a structure a heavy object at the center of the atom that was the interpretation of the other so that this interpretation intuition and working out matters in physics okay so simple speculation may not lead to great discoveries so this is what i want to tell the next generation scientist uh, here now in the same journey from electrons to quarks so we started from a tabletop experiment we moved to the deep inelastic scattering to know the proton structure at electrons on protons at slack the strand fourth linear accelerator center and from the tabletop experiment now my accelerator became 3.2 kilometers keep keep this dimension in mind so we slowly moved from tabletop experiment to 3.2 kilometers so you look at the proton structure so we discovered uud is the structure you know quark structure of proton similarly neutron structure is udd and with uh, the advancement of the detector technology we started exploring different families of quarks and leptons and by now our understanding shows that we have three different families up down charm strains top bottom and similarly for leptons and this happened through the universal formula of de broglie giving us the hint that we need higher and higher energies to probe lower in the dimension and keep in mind that you know this deep inelastic scattering of the proton structure probing happened with a 3.2 linear accelerator at stanford linear collider in slack now what is the difficulty if you look at our standard qed which has you know we have good understanding and go to qcd qcd is the quantum chromodynamics the theory of uh, uh, in a public lecture i don't want to bore it but i will give you giving a hint that you know what is happening uh, when we go for qed to qcd if i take a neutral atom here i give some energy and i kick out the outer shell electron 
I can separate the electron. I can see separately the constituent. This never happens in the quark domain, in the strong interaction of the quantum chromodynamics. If you take a proton, which is white, so we have three quarks inside, and I want to, these are confined inside protons, so I want to separate them. So what will happen is, once I go to separate them, this color field will actually rise. I cannot separate them. So slowly, so what is going to happen is, quark anti-pair, anti-quark pair will be created from the vacuum, and instead of separating these quarks, so what will happen, you know, quark anti-quark pair will pop up from the vacuum, and one of the anti-quarks will be uh, clubbed with a quark, making a quark anti-quark combination, which is a meson, which is pi n, and three quark combination will give me a baryon. So this tells me, this simply explains the confinement property of quarks, why we cannot see quarks freely in the laboratory. So still, you know, we are not satisfied with this. We want to see quarks uh, in a different dimension, not, you know, beyond the dimension of hadrons. So inside the hadrons, we know those are confined. So now people, you know, scientists, they never stop uh, with, uh, stop with some satisfaction level. So they go up to the next level. So next level was deconfining these uh, hadrons. Can we see these uh, patterns, which are actually quarks and gluons? with a dimension which is higher than the case of the hadrons. So the concept of having a quark gluon plasma came up. So can we see these patterns? Collectively, I say patterns to quarks and gluons. So this term was coined by Feynman, or by Richard Feynman. And uh, these patterns, if can be seen in a higher dimension, like nuclear level, means the beyond the hadronic dimension, which is actually defined after uh, the discovery at uh, RIG, Brookhaven National Laboratory. It is a locally thermally equilibrated state of matter with partonic degrees of freedom, but the dimension is not the uh, uh, hadronic dimension. It is rather higher than the hadronic dimension. So we expected at uh, RIG energies that we can see a primordial matter, which is quark plasma in the laboratory by colliding heavy nuclei. So the journey to the beginning of the universe started with heavy ion collisions. This is the history of the universe in a schematic way. So we believe in a big bang collision. Two heavenly objects collided at very high temperature, giving rise to a, essentially a thermal fireball. And we know any high temperature, if the atmospheric temperature is less, so this will start expanding, cooling down. And this is what happened and many complex systems happened in between. And with billions of years, billions of years, almost, uh, you know, so many billion of years, we are here today. And this is the evolution of the universe. And the universe today, if you look at the scale of observation, the nature operates in a scale of around 10 to the power of 60, mic uh, 60 orders of magnitude, micro to macro. So this is what I teach sometimes in my classical mechanics course. If you take your fundamental dimensions like mass, length, and time, you try to see as a human being without using any instrument with your perception, what is the order of magnitude you can perceive? You will realize the dimension, which is the dimension for common people. Okay? So common means, you know, uh, the normal dimension which we can perceive will stay within 10 to the power 10 order of magnitude. For example, in a blue sky, I climb a mountain, I can see almost 10 kilometers. This is my range. And if I look into the laboratory, I can see few millimeter or fraction of millimeter or the hair dimension, something like that. So if you calculate in the length scale, this will give me 10 to the power 10. So this is the dimension, middle dimension, which we can perceive as a classical object. But nature, as you can see, operates in 10 to the power 60 order of magnitude. So nature has been always beautiful and complex. It is our job to understand the complexity of nature and to cover this micro to macro dimension, we need very sophisticated technological advancements. And this also needs huge resources and collaborations. You can see, for micro, we need accelerators like LHC. And if you go to macro, like observing the whole universe, 
or galaxies and things like that solar system we need the radio telescopes as our instruments so this is the full scale where our nature operates it is very wonderful that human perception lies in 10 to the power 10 order of magnitude whereas the nature operates in the order of magnitude of 10 to the power 60. in my perception is beautiful and you know we should pursue our journey in science okay so nature in its full glory microcosm to cosmos on the left hand side i show you the large hadron collider in the CERN, the european laboratory for particle physics which is 150 meters underground 20 centi 27 kilometers circular collider and it is a tunnel of four meter diameter you can drive a small car inside and this is built to 1.1 millimeter per kilometer precision so in each one kilometer, the precision of the tunnel is 0.1 mm. So you can think about the civil engineering, the mechanical engineering, and the precision uh, engineering aspect in digging this LHC tunnel and allowing us to do. Uh, again, a symmetric approach of science and technology. So if you look at the cosmos, so this is microcosm. And if you look at the cosmos, it is another end is a Hubble telescope. So which is 50 square meters and operates almost 500 kilometers above the Earth's surface. So as I told you in my last slide, nature operates in the full scale in 10 to about 60 order of magnitude. It is essentially microcosm to the cosmos. And we need microscopic probes to the microscopic probes, microscopes to telescopes. So nature is really beautiful in that perspective. Now, let me take a collider experiment, which is actually our job. So, if you look at this uh, um, picture, so there is a tree which is static, fixed, and somewhere a car is coming and colliding with this. So, this is equivalent to a fixed target experiment. Okay, the severity of the damage is very less, you can see. But if you look at a US highway or Indian highway, and two cars going with huge velocity speeding vehicles they collide with each other so the damage is huge and as physicists we are interested in the damage so if the damage is more we look into the debris we try to find out what is the fundamental constituent of matter because looking into the car i cannot know if it's plastic or it is aluminium or what it is made of so if i look into the debris here possibly i can know this is the very principle of making the making the maximum damage or in the microscopic scale of heavy ions and melting the heavy ions and looking into the debris. So that is the basic principle of collider experiment. And I guess this should convince you why colliding beams or colliding experiments are much higher uh, in energy compared to the available energy in fixed target. So if you go to the technical knowledge, I take 450 GV beam energy and I have a fixed target here, available energy per particle production will be 29 GV. But if you take colliding beams of 450, 450, and there is a collision, it will be 900. So the uh, energy available for particle production is much higher, and it is equivalent to this kind of a highway speeding vehicle collision compared to your fixed target collision, which is shown here. Yeah. So this actually tells me two Lorentz contracted heavy nuclei colliding with each other and smashing it completely with very high temperature and through E is equal to mc square many particles are produced in the final state and we have dedicated detectors which i'm going to show you so those actually look into the track of these particles and give hint of you know what might have happened uh, at the early universe scenario okay so this cartoon i liked it and let me tell you here how energy becomes matter so this particular cartoon says i make collision of two strawberries and since this is matter also, this strawberry collision will give me energy. This is energy. And now energy, this energy can produce many different kinds of fruits like bananas, pears, uh, apple, and uh, whatnot, cherries. And fish is also produced here, you can see. And this was actually part of the book written by Herwig Stoffer. So this book I like very much. City visited. So he told, don't write creation. Creation is always by God. 
so make it production so that is the reason this correction stage here i find it very interesting pope saying okay so i believe e is equal to mc square and whatever you are doing is fantastic but please change creation to production okay so this is a different story so now i told you the the way vision works i have a lamp giving me light lambda lambda is some wavelength of light visible light that is an object here and this uh, light is scattered from the object and comes to my eyes i can see the object this is the way i see and exactly the same principle being applied here in the particle detection i have an accelerator which gives me the probe of lambda wavelength lambda and this lambda should be comparable with uh, object length comparable and less and this this particle probe particle gets deflected from this particular object scattered with some angle and i have detector in terms of eyes so i could see the particle track then it is the scientific job of analyzing the data and interpreting it okay so this is the fundamental principle coming from our vision the way we see so if you go to accelerators for the common people not for experts so we have a potential difference of 1 volt and my basic equation e is equal to qv or qu will tell me that you know if an electron is uh, left uh, in a potential difference of uh, one volt so the energy uh, required or achieved is one electron volt and since i compared our hydrogen uh, atom ionization energy of uh, you know 13.6 electron volt which is essentially 13 batteries lhc operates using 700 uh, 7000 trillion multiplied by 2 this number of batteries so you can see the way we have evolved from table top experiments to uh, big accelerators again in the similar way starting from one electron volt so we operate one at one tera electron volt which is a trillion electron volt so this is just to give you the numbers and these numbers for a physicist makes no sense unless we have a physical realization that is the reason at least before going to the subatomic level i know what is electron and what is proton and how does or how do their masses go 0.5 mev electron mass 1 gb around 936 uh, 938 mev which is roughly 1 gb and the higgs boson which is discovered at cern in 2012 so you can see that you know the uh, it is very high 125 gb 126 gb error i have not given here and um, this gives me a flavor of the energy i am talking about so the central mass energy where i am working at lhc so that is actually you know 13 or 14 tera electron volt so you can think of the energy scale i am talking about and accelerator to just to not to get frightened accelerators are not new to us if people of our time uh, have seen that the television set was a big box so that is uh, that is called actually cathode ray, uh, ray tube of that time so this cathode rays are produced which are electrons those are again using the same principle getting deflected uh, in the magnetic field accelerated in the electric field and they go and uh, you know uh, make a mark in the screen which we can see in a similar concept exactly applying the similar concept we move to a high energy accelerators so the next generation accelerator i show you here it is very complex the schematic you can see here and you start thinking why there are small rings and then it is a big ring so if uh, you do not ask this question let me specify here once you accelerate the particles the relativistic mass of the probe particle like proton or heavy ion so they go on increasing very heavily and at certain point of time when the velocity is up to 99% of the velocity of light so that becomes very difficult and technologically so you can see so this is related to energy the the radius of this uh, circles which are actually accelerator rings so that also is synchronized with the particle energy so here i show you the underground detector underground is schematically seen here so you can see it is a 27 km ring so this is swiss map swiss map this is uh, French map so this covers in the territory of France and Switzerland at the border so it has a different experiments like Alice so i participate from Alice and uh, India is a part in this experiments in CMS and Alice collaborations and these are all underground experiments so you can see you know it is 
150 meters down, but it has some elevation also. Very few people know about the elevation. And you must think, what is the technological challenges, civil and mechanical engineering, when you start digging the tunnel, you will find both mountain and lake. Geneva Lake is nearby, as you can see here. So it goes through Geneva Lake, okay? Nearby Geneva Lake. And there is uh, Geneva Airport here, okay? Fantastic view when you land here and see the globe of knowledge. Uh, uh, which actually headquarters the uh, southern administrative building is near Atlas. Yeah. So now let me show you the next generation detectors. You see, detectors are very big. A person standing here. So I am showing this detector because this was very instrumental in discovering our God particle, the Higgs particle. And uh, this is again next generation detector CMS. India has participation. Many detectors are made in Tata Institute and Bhava Atomic Research Center. And again, the detector where we are involved, particularly me, <laughs> and many of our collaborators from India, 13 14 institutes I'm talking, going to talk about. So those are actually involved in ALICE. This is again a dedicated detector to study the primordial matter, which is quark gluon plasma. And the detector you see here, the photon multiplicity detector is India made. So, you know, we are not lagging behind too much. Okay. So anyway, the Western world is uh, way ahead, both technology wise and uh, basic science, but we are also at par. This also tells us that, you know, just putting an Indian detector there is not a small job. It is their land, their control, and we are part of the game. It is not a small thing. And uh, just to tell you the scale, so one of the detectors of this experiment is a time projection chamber. And you can see a person is sitting inside the, uh, this and, and uh, making some electronic uh, repairing. So this tells us a tabletop experiment to the high energy big uh, trackers and uh, look at the dimension. Now the launching of the CMS experiment was a marvel as you can see in 2004 the 150 meters tunnel which I have actually seen it takes uh, you know in CMS uh, I have gone inside to see these uh, detectors and you can see it takes four five minutes in a lift to go down. So nothing was here and you assemble a detector and you see the a few tons of detectors and when you put it inside uh, you know people usually in india um, again we are not diminishing our efforts but you know we would take a heavy object from one place to another place our precision of or the tolerance level you know you know that matters and you can see 150 meters taking it down with that precision that you know it should go in this hole without making a little touch anywhere that is also a precision in engineering and you see the marvel of lowering it down and then putting it on the bench is not easy job yeah so again you can see the each detector is like a 100 megapixel camera which takes 40 million pictures per second you look at your advanced slr camera and compare with our high energy experimental detectors which serve like cameras but they take very high resolution 100 megapixel uh, pictures with 40 million pictures per second so this is what is our data taking rate and this is the precision we work with now if i do not talk about god particle so things will be incomplete and the Nobel prize in 2013 went to francois and lot and peter hicks if you see the Nobel statement it says for the theoretical discovery of a mechanism that contributes to our understanding of the origin of the mass of subatomic particles and which recently was confirmed through the discovery of a predicted fundamental particle by which is important atlas and cms experiments at some large hadron collider this is the credit we are taking because you know it is a large scale collaboration it was theorized in 1964 by francois and and um, peter higgs and another group and um, you see the discovery took so much of time in 2012 only it was discovered so you think what might have gone both physics and technology wise why it takes so much so many years to discover a particle if it is conjectured or theorized you know in 60s so 64 it was you know uh, theoretical hint was given 92 atlas cms collaborations founded 
2012 the new particle discovered and atlas spokesperson of that time who is fabiola gionati is our son director general now so she is congratulating peter hicks in the sun main auditorium a very good cartoon which was shown during that time in us was this is american obesity you can see person eating too much getting obesity and he says no 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 it's not my mistake it is not my fault i was born with too many higgs bosons because higgs boson is responsible of for mass generation so that is the re reason i was born with too many higgs bosons that is why i am massive so this was a cartoon came just after uh, higgs discovery which i find interesting now for a common man how do i understand how higgs field gives mass so think about a cocktail party guests are evenly spread people are just evenly spread everywhere so there is a celebrity who arrives and people start clustering around the celebrity with the, the original velocity of the celebrity will now will be you know slower down so you can see the slowing down of the velocity of a person is also equivalent to getting effective mass so people can realize this from the effective mass of electron in our solid state physics so this also acts like the higgs field is the guess are like higgs fields and uh, you know the higgs uh, the particle getting mass is because of <clears throat> the way you interact with the field okay so now next 10 15 minutes let me go to the social benefits i guess i could convince you what is the need of doing high energy physics basic science at the micro I cannot take you to the cosmos, but microcosm I have covered and uh, let's look into the social benefits. Okay, so let me start with electron. Electron microscopy uses a beam of accelerated electrons. If you look at the wavelength, it is 10 to the power 5 times shorter than the visible light. So that makes it powerful. And the resolving power of the electron microscope will be much higher compared to the normal microscopes so that I can actually see the objects like cells, microorganisms, biopsy samples and nanostructures. So just let me tell you that these nanoparticles possess different physical and chemical properties and biological effects than bulk materials. This is because of the high surface to volume ratio which is a bit technical but you know I should put some technical points for the next generation to think of, start building up their own uh, thoughts. So this has the ability to interact with the biological molecules. And nanotechnology is used in drug, drug delivery and cancer therapy for controlled release and targeting of the drugs. So nanotechnology helps. Like silver nanoparticles are used in the silver nitrate, the silver X gel for better drug delivery. So this is one example. If you just take the leaflet which comes inside the silver X ointment, I have read you know how these silver nanoparticles help and nanotechnology we know for fabrication of nanoparticles and characterization every day in every basic science laboratories starting from my institute IITL indoor to any place you'll find electron microscopes of various kinds so you may ask how does electron microscope helps me in the corona age I prefer to put a TEM image of coronavirus People say, wash your hand frequently with soap solution. How does that come from? <laughs> How does that come? So if you see, washing hands uses a soap which destroys the coronavirus. Corona is a self-assembled nanoparticle with lipid fatty bilayers. If we eat a oily food, we usually wash our hand in soap solution. After that, we will not find any oil in our hand exactly in a similar concept this microorganism which is actually at the nano dimension the coronavirus it has a lipid fatty bilayer what soap does is that destroys the virus by dissolving this fatty bilayer how do i know the corona structure the tm image tells me that the corona has a fatty bilayer simply you can destroy by repeatedly assuming that there is a corona in my hand coronavirus so then i wash my hand and that destroys so that is the reason of using soap and frequent okay so these are few examples of basic science applications and you think of which way it helps the modern uh, society now so look at corona has made a shutdown of the whole world 
unless you understand the structure of corona if you can do not understand how dna structure is there and you know many intricate uh, um, aspects of biology and biomedical engineering we cannot come up with a corona vaccine which is the game of basic science and technology in a symbiotic way again i repeat so not these are few examples and almost all subatomic particles have got direct or indirect short term or long term social benefits now in the pathway of an innovation let me start with the cloud chamber picture of positron track so in 1932 the first antiparticle was discovered from the cosmic rays by carl anderson in caltech usa he got nobel prize for that in 1936 his mentor just to excite you his mentor was robert millikan we know him from millikan's oil drop experiment measuring that e by m of electron he also got nobel prize in 1923 mentor matters that is what i want to say here and you see after the first antiparticle detection or observation from cosmic rays you may wonder what is there in antiparticle so now i will talk about this positron emission tomography pet scanning for cancer i am coming to that and starting from this kind of imaging we have gone through producing antiparticles in the laboratory and you know in 1995 uh, some researchers used low energy antiproton ring to slow down the accelerated antiprotons which are produced in the uh, accelerators and by doing so they managed to pair positrons and antiprotons together and producing nine hydrogen anti atoms which is essential anti hydrogen atoms and their lifetime is small but they could produce anti particles or anti atoms in the laboratory this is a big uh, you know landmark in discovery at cern in our high energy accelerators and people started thinking you know if we can do this you know particle anti particle annihilation can give me energy so with the same concept the nasa scientist in the year 2000 they announced early design for the anti matter engine that might capable of fueling a spaceship for a trip to mars using only a millionth of a gram of antimatter you think now from 1932 from the discovery of positron to the year now in 2020 it has taken almost 90 years or so but we have made tremendous advancement in the technology just using the fundamental particle discovery of anti uh, electron which is positron so now let's go to the positron emission tomography as you can see here this is a image of positron emission tomography the basic principle behind this is so let's say somebody suffering from cancer or brain cancer it is complicated to you know diagnose so what we do is we inject a tracer tracer is something like fluorine 18 which is a radioactive material and we get from cytotron which is again an accelerator and um, this is injected to the blood and this goes and sits in many uh, um, infected infected means your uh, cancerous cell and healthy cell and what happens is if you look into uh, the theory what is happening there we have actually this uh, fluorine 18 is a positron source so this positron annihilates with the nuclear electrons okay and creates 511 kv two gammas and if you think of the kinematics these two gamma particles at the end they will be produced conserving the momentum almost back to back why do i say almost back to back it is kind of 180 but if this particle is in little motion so that actually will destroy the 180 degree uh, gamma so then what i will do is i can back trace it so i go to the line of what is that called in biological language lor so uh, line of uh, Uh, i am not getting that line uh, term immediately so that is a back projection line essentially so if i have uh, two scintillator detectors again scintillator detector uh, detector started with high energy physics i would say uh, detecting this uh, high energy photons so these two photons once are detected i can backtrack to get the position of this uh, uh, cancerous cell so this is the way positron emission tomography has helped in the imaging of cancerous cells and uh, this is one of the examples and uh, this also helps that you know high energy accelerators should be in place 
to produce this radionuclides. And many detectors, for example, used in subatomic particle detection have got place in medical imaging. And it is a blessing to the mankind. And the practical example, if you Google it, you will find George Charpot, a, a scientist in high energy physics. So he got the Nobel Prize in 1992, who is a some experimental uh, physicist for the discovery of multi-wire proportional counter, which is used in the particle detection in high energy physics. So slowly he found medical application is beautiful and he moved to medical applications. So these are few of the imagings done using high energy uh, detectors. Now if you look at hadron therapy for medical applications, almost 9,000 of 17,000 accelerators operating in the world today are used for medicine purpose. So proton, you know, this, this is the map of uh, Europe having different particle therapy centers, carbon um, ion and uh, proton uh, beam uh, for the uh, accelerators. So this image shows Loma Linda Medical Center in US, which has a proton therapy. In India, just to excite you, so we have one operating in Chennai, Apollo Proton Center, with a cost of 1300 crore Indian rupees, it is established. And Tata Memorial Center in Mumbai is going to get, it is announced in 2019. So let me tell you a little physics just to excite you. What is the difference between radiation therapy and hadron therapy? When I say radiation therapy, it is a beam of X-rays, photons. This not only destroys the cancer cells, this also damages the healthy tissues because if you look at the profile, so this is the depth in body. You can think of, you know, there is a tumor inside the body. So this is the depth. So this is the X-ray profile, the photon. So photon starts depositing highest energy at the beginning. So this destroys the healthy cells and it runs to very high depth. So essentially after the therapy, uh, radiation therapy, more healthy cells are destroyed. But if you go to hadron therapy, which is proton, a beam of charged particle will penetrate the tissues without much diffusion and deposit maximum energy before stopping. This is because if you look at the profile of a charged particle depositing energy, so the energy deposition is inversely proportional to one over velocity square. So when velocity is very less, the energy deposition will be the highest. So that is the reason I can actually calculate for a certain energy at what depth it can deposit all of its energy. So that is called Bragg peak of that hadron. So you can see without depositing very high energy in the healthy cells, I just see at what depth my cancerous cell is there and I try to radiate it with hadrons depositing complete energy so that you know the damage of the healthy cell is least and you can see india is going to get the second proton therapy center and at the when you wonder at what time this was proposed i should tell you the first director of formula of usa had the idea in 1946 and first patient was treated in us in 1950 so us could come up very quickly in four years and you see where we lie in technological developments and basic science is important i have been giving emphasis now let's go to the very non stop of world wide web when the proposal was given by tim berners lee in 1989 his boss mike sandel told that idea is vague but looks exciting so he told vague but exciting so you can find some some t-shirts written as vague at the back of the T-side is written big but exciting. So without getting you know suppressed, uh, Tim Berners-Lee went ahead and uh, discovered WWD, uh, invented WWW, uh, which is World Wide Web. And this is the plate, you know, the brass plate, which is actually placed in front of uh, Tim Berners-Lee's office. He's no longer working for CERN. But if you see CERN corridor building one, when we work from our cafeteria, to our Alice building through this corridor, we always get excited to see this plate. So this shows that this is the office where Tim Berners-Lee invented World Wide Web. And this was a necessity 
of transferring data transferring data from one office to another office or people sitting at different corners of the world so this was a necessity of high energy physics experiment and this goes back to left days the large uh, the large electron positron collider days of 1989 and you can see this was the first server so these are now in microcosm for public museum and scientific leadership i would say it is very important as you can see son dg of that time carlo professor carlo rubia in uh, you know took a decision that uh, there should not be any patent on this www so uh, the, this uh, document of son shows that son relinquishes all intellectual property rights you mind the words the way it is written Some relinquishes all intellectual property rights to this code, both source, binary form, and permission is granted for anyone to use, duplicate, modify, and redistribute the way it is written, and it is not patented. Otherwise, technological development is impossible. And taking a scientific leadership and coming to this kind of decision is very very important. That is the reason in India, in the world also. good scientific leaders are very very important as you can see from here so how do i prove this so i go back to faraday who discovered electricity he approached william gladstone the british chancellor of exchequer the ministry of finance and he told sir i have discovered electricity okay so then the minister says what is the practical value of electricity so this happened in 19 1850 you can see so faraday just replied one day sir you may tax it so you see if you a single click of internet today or switching on your light if you have to tax you have to give tax to sun or faraday what will be the life so that is the reason i would say science should not be patented and scientific leadership is important now you see this world wide web i will take another 5 minutes so what what why if you see again our uh, son former dg harwick soper writes each time one types http or make a google search or write www one unknowingly pays tribute to son this is the immense contribution coming from son this was the biggest spin off of collider experiment large data sample huge number of people involved in the experiment multi country participation and the need of data access to all remember this is not a fun that everybody participates thousands of people participate because it is a need of physics you think seriously it is a need of physics more people people participation more number of authors in the paper it is a physics need and doing the common goal of doing world class physics at the frontier at the fundamental level is the aim like electricity internet is now in each and every home we started feeling internet is part of life what is great about it so you see what is the immense contribution basic science has given to us in the bad days of covid 19 ww is ww is of immense help in reaching out people contact tracing information exchange administrative management scientific collaboration in developing vaccine online teaching and the lecture we are giving now we are interacting through this online lecture everything now depends upon internet so you tell me if we thank high energy physics we should thank the you know the physics or the basic science at the microscopic level and related applications or not so this is the internet map everybody in the world is using internet now this is just a glimpse of internet map and another by product of high energy physics is the technology of grid computing you see it at any corner of the world you submit a job and that job will run in the cpu of computer sitting in us south africa europe anywhere so this kind of grid computing is coming or we are using now you know my students sitting in iit indore they are submitting jobs which is executed at any corner of the world and similarly the medical data so this is of immense use grid computing technology this is again a by product of high energy physics so if you look at top screen frank beck and ben stupe the engineers from sharm developed a transparent touch screen in early 1970s the first first touch screen was manufactured at sharm and to put to use in 
but we need many more technological developments. This is the first goal. So with time, many touchscreen technologies have developed capacity, resistive to work with a high temperature, or high humidity environment. And now we are in an era of smart technology. You see your Apple Watch, you have everything. Navigation, how much steps you have taken, your own physiological activities, your heartbeat, everything is there in your Apple Watch, smart watch, I'd say. Okay, so the way the smart technology is coming up, you have to see, you know, the requirement of basic science everywhere. Okay, not to go to the details because time is over almost, some more social benefits. So if you look at aerospace engineering, aerospace applications, sun has collaborations, people are working, applying physics to financial markets and um, construct the electrochemical sensors for water pollution treatment software solutions for automated driving, safe time, the general aviation safety and the collaboration with Sun KT, Medipix chips, medical imaging for space dosimetry, all these things actually you can see which way now Sun is making a symbiotic approach with other technological firms, industries, you can actually visit uh, this website of Sun. okay? So these are all, you know, whatever information I gave, all are from genuine sources. Now, before I finish, let me a little bit of talk about the Alice collaboration when we work as a part of the mega science project in India. We are several institutes you can see. This is the map of India. Many institutes are involved and it is generously funded by our Department of Atomic Energy and Department of Science and Technology. And we have been contributing from detector making to data taking, data analysis, large scale data analysis and physics publications. And uh, uh, training the next generation in an immense way, you can see almost we have contribution since more than 20 years. So India contribution in the world map is this. So India has contributed in many ways, detector, PMD, muon tracker, and this multiplex analog signal processor, common readout board, silicon tungsten calorimeter proposal, and LHC grid computing in Calcutta and Bombay, and let me little advertise here in Institute of Physics. In my PhD days, I also did soldering of this unit module fabrication, which went to Brookhaven National Laboratory for the photon multiplicity detector. So what is the way forward? Future accelerators, just two, two slides more. So if you look at what is way forward, we have participation in pair experiment at Darmstadt, Germany, EIC, the electron ion collider, so here India is participating and these accelerators are coming up. Dubna, the Nika accelerator, and most importantly, the 100 kilometers future collider, future circular collider is coming at CERN. People who are working now in 2040 around, so this will be available for taking data and doing science. So this is the next generation accelerator coming up in Geneva. And people also talk about international linear accelerator so this is this may come in japan europe or us and starting from the slack accelerator linear accelerator of 3.5 kilometer long now it is coming up with 30 to 50 kilometers and china is also not far behind china's accelerator for circular electron positron of 80 kilometers is coming up i don't know what is the status by now it is in the urban stage and finally if you ask scientists, yes, we have some answers. We do not claim that we have understood everything. So let me finish here. Nothing is too wonderful to be true if it is consistent with the laws of nature. This is Michael Faraday. And my statement here is precision science and technology is the call for next generation. And I recall 100 years back almost, Niels Bohr gave a statement that the physics or the discovery in basic science will lie at sixth decimal places, meaning a precision science is the next generation call. I thank you very much for having patience and listening to me for one hour and 15 minutes. And uh, uh, the thing which is getting famous worldwide is in COVID days, Namaskar to all of you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ragnarji. Uh, thank you for your wonderful talk. I will request uh, our coordinator, Dr. Vijay Rajji, if you have a question from the student.
and participant side please ask sir uh, there is few questions from the audience sure so first question from chandan and uh, he is asking uh, why bo why bosons are termed as mediator of interaction why not fermion yeah so question is bit uh, interesting and uh, little technical also so but i can just convince you uh, the interacting particles so if you take uh, electromagnetic interaction photon is the mediator so you talk about uh, strong interaction gluons are the mediators and you talk about uh, graviton so gravity okay uh, so all these actually the mediator particles which are responsible for the force are found to be consistent with the properties of a boson so i think you know without going to more technical details which may bore the uh, common audience because it's a public lecture so i would say all particles all mediating particles are found to be bosons these are called gauge bosons in technical language and uh, so another question from uh, pushpraj uh, through the realistic uh, laboratory experiment could be measure the longest pr proton lifetime proton lifetime so if you see uh, proton is the lightest baryon okay so always a particle obeying all conservation laws to decay to another particle so you should have another low mass baryon state within the standard model another uh, lighter baryon compared to proton is not available so this will actually violate the baryon number conservation which is very fundamental within the standard model of physics but just to excite you there are papers and people have already worked on that like the famous uh, dirac medal scientist yogesh pati from odisha and uh, other people they have worked on beyond standard model, standard model physics of proton decay and this is also associated with neutrino oscillation neutrino getting mass so this is beyond the standard model physics and our host professor venkatesh singh is expert on neutrinos and if you are still higher than interested in a higher way so we can actually communicate by email because i would say why proton cannot decay so this thing should convince you and it is found that if at all proton decays the lifetime will be 10 to the power 32 years and you may ask me how do you measure 10 to the power 32 years that is a different technical question so you can be in touch with me in email i can uh, explain you in more details thank you interesting question so thank you sir uh, so thank you sir so now venkatesh sir there is uh, no more question so venkatesh sir okay so uh, thank you vijay raj ji we have heard really very informative impressive and motivational lecture with application and products playing important role and affecting our day to day life of dr ragnath sahu ji he is from iit indore and very interactive question and answer sessions i would request dr vijay raj ji please give the vote of thanks Uh, dr sahu sir uh, we are all inspired by your great work uh, big thanks to dr sahu for uh, ins uh, giving uh, inspiring motivational uh, talk and i am sure uh, the student and all the present here uh, will have a lot of to gain uh, from his talk uh, i would like to thanks to professor venkatesh singh and also my colleagues uh, for their support and help and finally the wonderful students who turned up in such great number not only from cusb but also from other institute so thank you so much for your cooperation once again i thank all uh, for your cooperation and support so thank you so much so now we can stop here okay so dear participants and colleague that is all for now we will see you next week same day that is on august 1st with different time that is 11:30 am with another wonderful speaker professor sunil kumar gupta of tata institute of fundamental research mumbai and cosmic ray laboratory ute he will speak on the study of solar storm and their impact on earth by muons
so until then stay safe stay healthy and keep thinking goodbye thank you thank you thank you sir